Hello, welcome to The New Craftsman and thank you for joining us and being our live studio audience <laughs> this evening. Um, my name is Elena Ford um, and I am Managing Director here at The New Craftsman um, and I have the pleasure of leading our uh, discussion um, this evening. So uh, today uh, we wanted to explore the role that craft plays in our interiors um, and this is really at the front and centre of our latest project Ways of Seeing which we launched for London Design Festival only just last week um, and for the project we invited three prestigious interior design studios to really show us how they would integrate um, our new collections into imagined spaces and the breadth of the output has actually been really incredible and each of the interior designers has delivered something really unique and expressive as as unique as the collections themselves actually and we wanted to explore that in more detail with these specific panel panel discussions um, so for the interior design um, that uh, Waldo Works imagined they actually encase the entire space in hand glazed hand cut um, tiles um, from the Rustication Collection uh, by uh, ceramic artist Matthew Raw, who is joining us here. Um, and you can see this beautifully brought to life by um, the illustrator we worked with, Caroline Aiken, who uh, had a dialogue with each of the interior designers um, and bringing that vision to life. Um, and we'll go more into detail into that new collection. And you would have seen it as you just walked in as well at the very front. Um, other pieces that are um, detailed within the illustration are the uh, beautiful sculptural uh, Michael Caine light by Alexander White and the copper clad uh, uh, articulate table by Matthew Cox. So very much about um, materiality and I know Tom will go into that a little bit later. Um, so these pieces are really, they show examples of how craft can be integrated in much more ambitious and fundamental ways um, to create complete spaces with real meaning, emotion and tactility. And that's precisely what we are going to um, discuss this evening with our wonderful panellists who I will now introduce. So, um, First of all, we have Matthew Raw here. Hello, Matthew. Um, <laughs> so Matthew is a ceramic artist who explores, and I need to get this right, the physical and communicative properties of the tile, uh, using texture, colour, and language to tell stories of people and place. Um, Matthew completed the very prestigious ceramics residency at the v in 2015 and was also awarded the um, Jerwood Award um, in 2014. Um, he, his work kind of spans galleries, educational establishments and has worked across, uh, across the globe. And we were so thrilled to work with Matthew this year on his first commercial tile range, the Rustication range, uh, which is a modular tile system in uh, different patterns and glazes. And we'll go into that in more detail um, later on. Um, representing Waldo Works, we have um, Tom Bartlett. Thank you for joining us. Um, so Tom founded Waldo Works 10 years ago with... 20 years ago. I got 10 yeah. on my bio so from your so team. Okay. <laughs> seem younger. But, yeah. <laughs> it just flies by. Just, um, so uh, Tom founded Waldo Works 20 years ago mm. with his partner, uh, Sasha von Meister and um, Andrew uh, Treverton. Uh, and together with their team, um, they have uh, completed a wide variety of inspirational projects from beautiful, elegant, um, high-end residential apartments to more branded commercial environments as well, um, but all imbued with a recognisable modern British um, design aesthetic. Um, and we have been working with Tom and his team since 2014, and we've always greatly admired and valued how they integrate craft into their projects. Um, ever enthusiastic about the tile. If you know Tom and Waldo Works' work, the, t the tile does feature and comes up quite a bit. Um, and we will be talking about why that is um, later on. Um, and then final, finally, we've got uh, Sonia uh, Solikari, um, who is a curator, writer, cultural leader, um, who has been working in the museum sector for uh, 20 years. And it is 20 years, it right? 20. Okay, good, yeah. I got that right. <laughs> um, so Sonia joins us from the Museum of the Home um, as the director uh, since uh, January 2017. 
uh, and overseeing uh, an 80 million development of the building and gardens. So we're all very excited to see those doors open and visit. Uh, before that, she was head of the Guildhall um, Art Gallery and the London's Roman Amphitheatre, and uh, most notably a curator of ceramics of glass at the v which mm. Matthew was at yes. only just previous. So we're very excited. Um, Sonia's going to be giving us that kind of rooted historical perspective um, on uh, tonight's theme. So... Um, thank you, thank you for having uh, for coming. <laughs> um, so, to begin, I thought we'd start by exploring that role and value um, of craft in interiors, and it's by no means a new concept. Um, obviously, Norman Day cathedrals were mm. forged by hands, bells, pillars, lectern, all of that, um, and then much, much later, um, at the close of the 19th century, you had the arts and craft movements where, you know, the handmaid was hugely celebrated. Mm. Um, it was almost a, a, a political statement, I think, is one of yeah. the things you said in our previous conversations. Yeah. So, Sonia, just to kick things off, mm. um, it'd be great just to understand how that dialogue between craft and interiors has evolved over the years, and if there's any specific people um, and examples that have really shifted and moved it on. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I think it's about conscious use of craft. I mean, that's been one of the big shifts over history. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like you said, sort of, if you just take the home, um, you know, the idea of cr craft in the home is, a, is as old as the idea of the home itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, most most things within the pre-industrial home were handmade and, mm -hmm. you know, were varying degrees of using tools and then, and then of course, machinery. Um, but I think, you know, almost from the beginning of time, there starts to get this, this idea of, of skill, centres of production. Mm -hmm. um, once you've got centres of production, you start to get guilds coming up in the, in, in the Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. um, and all of these start to shift that craft dynamic. You know, what does it mean to be a craftsperson at these various points in time? And should that be something that is protected and celebrated? Um, and then, of course, it shifts. I mean, I'm, I'm leaping, leaping through the centuries. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, then, of course, it... it it shifts hugely um, in the industrial age, which was a long process, actually. The Industrial Revolution, I think we always think of as this like moment, um, this explosion. And of course, it, it went on for decades, arguably <coughs> centuries, you know, that division of labour and craft. Um, and so, but of course, then craft kind of from the 19th century onwards has always been in conversation with the machine. I think we've never really sort of recaptured that sense of innocence about craft it's mm -hmm. it's always in dialogue yes. with you know how far do you go do you go that purist view like like William Morris everything in your home should be handmade mm. or um I think most people the reality is that it's a blend isn't it um yeah. and certainly from the 19th century we, we, we see that a, a real blend of the industrial and the, and, and the handmade and most people are comfortable with that so yeah the, the, the dialogue it kind of picks and troughs and, and the kind of you know what the thinkers are saying is sometimes different to how people are actually how that manifests in their what home, the reality how, is how they're living with it mm. yeah so. no absolutely no I couldn't agree more mm. I think that sort of that tension between handmade and I guess you know the the natural evolution of how tools and things kind of innovate mm. and how we kind of bring that into the craft practice is always sort of yeah it's the ongoing tension I think within a craft maker's yeah, practice yeah for sure um so um Tom coming to you in terms of the value that you see craft bringing to this to a space. What do you feel those particular properties are? Those qualities that well, are quite unique. Um, I think successful interiors are really about, or creating, being creative about successful interiors. In successful interiors, is about adjacencies, and it's always about the dialogue between objects, or you know, this is out of the obviously this is the functional requirements of mm. what one needs to do, but it's always about how. Um, how things appear in a space. So you can imagine a piece of craft in a kind of white gallery space might look very different to a sort of crowded Victorian, my mother's house mm -hmm. sort of thing. And I think the, the, what now we've, we've cleaned out our interiors, which has been a movement for a very long time. I think you, we've started to, objects, craft objects have started to resonate more mm -hmm. to us because they are, they're imbued with a certain sense of kind of, I think one is authority there is the idea of the expert and the idea of this thing is made by someone who knows what they're doing. And that has a kind of imbued sense of sort of, I suppose, expensiveness or fineness, which lots of people are looking for yeah. in their interiors. I mean, the objects are unique. Yes. Because but making something by hand is 
you know, it creates unique objects. Even if you're trying to do a repetition, it yes. doesn't normally work, as I found out on my potter's wheel. It doesn't, <laughs> so it's absolutely impossible. Um, I think the other thing is they have, I mean, I never say this sort of thing, but they do have a certain sense of soul or some sense of, you know, there, there, there is something about them that resonates personality or, or the person behind them. I think that's a... But the other thing that's really important, and I think you should, you, you've got to remember when you're doing interiors, is the, the you know, commissioning. So when you get to a certain level of sort of trying to produce quite difficult, technical, mm -hmm. big spaces with many elements in them, mm -hmm. you do tend to find just the need to commission something because you can't find something that's machine made. You have to, like, you have to, you know, make this crazy thing that you've decided mm -hmm. is exactly the right thing to sit in there. And frankly, you can do that if you are doing a one-off commission you talk to craftspeople and you make make these things, irrespective of the sort of objects here or, you know, you, a joiner or, or someone who knows what they're doing in mm. these sort of very high-end interiors is, is, is obviously incredibly important. So yeah. it's commissioning is, is actually one of the major things that yeah. you, you need as an interior designer to be able yeah. to do. No, I think, and you mentioned quite a few things, but it's interesting to kind of see the craft maker as the problem solver, yeah. craft as the, you know, the coming in with the solution. But you also mentioned, I guess, it being the ultimate statement of individualism mm -hmm. and also, also connoisseurship, you know, that sort yeah. of, that cultural currency mm. of this is in my home, I can talk about this, I can mm. share this with others. And it's, it's sort of, it's also, it doesn't make you look rich, it makes you look clever, which is always quite good for a client in terms <laughs> of, you know, it, it's, uh, well, for our clients, yeah, you, you, you speak for your, absolutely. But sort of, I think no, but you can, that, you know, people yeah. buy stuff to look ritzy, or they, you know, or they, or they want to, or they look want to look kind of authoritative you know. and <laughs> yes. culturally engaged. Okay, we'll There's that other instead. ways, <laughs> diplomatic ways of putting that. Um, okay, Matt's giggling over there. Hey, Matt. Um, so Matt, just coming to you as as a craft maker, what what are you hoping uh, you're you're bringing uh, to a space with your with your craft um, with your materiality? Yeah, I guess, I guess I guess that's the word. Um, I kind of go back to when I when I started my my relationship with Clay, which was actually at university. I, I hadn't really dabbled that much uh, prior to that, and. Um, I loved it because you could you could make something fast and it could be full of expression. It could be full of life and it reflects, I don't know, maybe some ideas that you're having or um, the mood that you were in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that, I don't know, that impatience that I had meant that it always led to my, my mark, the, the mark of the maker being very present. And it's something that I kind of haven't really refined out of my work in all those years. I, I, I like the fact that you know, you, crude isn't the right word, but you know, there's there's a there's a, there's a there's a there's clearly a relationship with the hand and the and the the clay in my case, um, and I didn't want to kind of get rid of that. And and with, with these tiles, it's quite obvious that they're not industrialized. And I was listening um, to what Son Sonia said about the the relationship with um, with industry, and obviously in relation to tiles, that that. They, they progressed so far, you can get them in any color, any size. I mean, some of these factories are making tiles that are, you know, they're taller than a person and it's one piece of ceramic, it's absolutely insane. It's amazing, but but I can't do that and uh, I don't want to do that. I want to I wanna express the, the, the handmade and that relationship between, I guess, a human and, and material. Yeah. Um, yeah, so kind of, I, I didn't really want to, I don't really want to get rid of that part of, of, of my work. But I guess, I guess I've got a question of, you know, what, what is the space? And, and the, mm. the fun part of this project was thinking about the domestic interior. So I've worked on facades and I've worked on maybe pieces for galleries and, and kind of other scenarios. But to really think about how to bring that into the home, um, maybe, or, or, or interior space without losing you know, being able to cover a wall, but without losing that relationship and that, that conversation with the hand, that, that's been the, the, the challenge and remains so. Yeah, and it's interesting, something that you've re referenced before is also the ability that it gives you to do scale. So, you know, yeah. obviously you can't make a tile like twice your height, but you can create and cover wall space with your expression and your creativity through this particular medium. 
Um, so is that is that really part of your draw and and what the allure is of the the ceramic tile to you? Yeah, absolutely. And, and we might touch on it later, but but I absolutely as a I don't know how when it was twenty fourteen for for the duo that you mentioned. I, I wanted to go big, but you are limited as a ceramic person with the size of your kiln, and we had a very normal size kiln so you can only make something as big as you can fit inside whereas with tiles i figured out and uh, no one told me that you can if you do make loads and loads and fire loads and loads you can go big and that was a revelation for me and allowed me to continue to try and clad and cover surfaces and you know in a, in a strange kind of small scale that's what led on to the the cabinet that i'm showing with you guys yes the, the green cabinet, I think it's caught everybody's eye as they walked in, the welcome cupboard, uh, which is um, em enveloped in green tiles on the outside and on the inside. Um, so maybe just it'd be worth reflecting on how that, that role and value of the tile has changed, mm. because it's obviously had a functional history and a decorative one. Um, and I wondered, Sonia, if you could shed any light about how that may have changed historically over time. Um, yeah, it's interesting because I, I think going go, going back, um, it, there's it's it's always been that mix of the decorative and the functional. Um, I think because often tiles have been on, on walls and you know in the same space that you you know you may be putting art. So, so people have always been interested in the pictorial and you know uh, you know as as with Matthew's works on the narrative as well. So mm -hmm. we get narrative tiles really quite early. I mean. Uh, and also, if, you know, if we look more recently to the 17th century Dutch tiles, for instance, you know, they've got a huge amount of humour in them. Mm. Um, and they're there to make people smile and they're playful. And um, going back to that idea, tiles are modular. They've always been modular. Mm. So you can kind of put together your own space. You can curate. I and mean, I don't think it was conceived quite like, like that in the, in the 17th century. But you could, like, curate your own space and, you know, go as earnest or as... Or, or as fun loving as, as as you like, and then you you know then then we, when we kind of sort of progress to the nineteenth century and, and tile production absolutely explodes, not mm. just industrially but also the return of of the craft w with within that. Um, you know you see see the most incredible kind of uh, narrative scenes. They get really sophisticated, but also again someone like William de Morgan going back to the arts and crafts, really sort of mm. playful figures who are kind of contorted and and. Um, you know, make, they, they just make you smile. So I think that has always been there, that sort of decoration. Is it decoration? Is it functional? Mm -hmm. um, of course, some of it is functional. It might be in a kitchen or it might be in a bathroom. But um, I think there's also been that, that idea that you might you might experiment and use colour. Yes. Um, and giving licence to the individual to actually be creative. Yeah, you know. yeah. But within that, I think, and, you know, this is really highlighted by, by the, the, the scheme here, mm. really. It's about portability versus the permanence because you know you can have portable ceramic objects as we've seen with you know with that gorgeous green cabinet and that's been there throughout time people have sort of clad tables etc but then there's the permanency of, of actually cladding a wall and, and that sort of commissioned mm. and it's bespoke mm. for that space and that's kind of a real statement and I think in more recent times it seems really rebellious as well it's like yes. it's like a rebellion against the property market isn't it yeah. because if you're really going for it <laughs> Like that. I mean, yeah, because you know, for so many years we've been told, oh, you know, put, put put white on your walls if you're wanting to sell it, and yeah. oh, you know, don't put a coloured tile in your bathroom. Yeah. Um, and actually, my God, you know, just go for it. I mean, it's quite it's yeah. quite a commitment as well because you're also saying that if you ever leave that house, most likely you're leaving those tiles behind for the next person. Yeah. Yeah. To enjoy. Um, or hate and tear out. I don't know. Each and yeah, their. yeah. There's a um, kind of real sort of generational passing it down yes. quality. I mean, I think if you're, you know, you're Lord Leighton and you're doing your Arab Hall back at Le Leighton, Leighton House, it's kind of, you know, that is a, that is a statement. And if you're buying mm -hmm. that off of Lord Leighton, you're kind of like buy, you're buying Arab Hall, aren't you? Really? Yeah, you're buying um, it with that whole yeah, look. You do, I and mean, you're you buying know, into it, it that style, that aesthetic, <laughs> and you've got to really like it because it's very prominent in yeah. the space. Um, which yeah. actually brings us next nicely on to um, a question really for you, Tom, about what are some of your favourite examples of uh, kind of the use of the tile in, in historical settings uh, that maybe you um, return to time and time again? When I was at school, I did a history of art A-level and there was this tiny little uh, bit in the sort of thing about this guy called Halsey Ricardo who's a sort of strange 
architect who, um, and I thought, oh, I can do my report on him because that's building is really close to where I live. And I went to this, which you will know is the Peacock House or Debenham House on Addison Road in West London. And I was completely transfixed by this idea of a kind of kind of black, smog-ridden London. And then him making these buildings that were covered in tiles not unlike <laughs> not unlike uh, that peacock blue over there. And the, the rain would come, the smog would go, everything else would be black, and there'd be this kind of shining beacon of kind of cleanliness. It was to do with a kind of the very, very yeah. sort of strong aesthetic. And that, um, that the, the hall and the, 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 all the passageways in that house are all clad in, in tile, in very beautiful. There's lots of William de Morgan in there as well. Mm. And in fact, actually, we've, we've copied that tile quite a few times and that there's a man up in Telford who makes still in the same way right. and makes that blend. Yeah. In fact, we've used them on a project um, with someone in the audience here. Um, <laughs> but there's, it's, um, so I think that house really got me when I was young and I, mm. I sort of really enjoyed that. Again, that sort of permanence and this mm. idea of slapping these things on that you can't yeah. kind of get rid of. Yeah. Um, I suppose Andre Putman, her use mm -hmm. of, I really enjoy that idea of the grid. Yeah. And the thing that it took, this sort of, you know, the, oh, the architect in me really appeals like, oh, the tile that modular, and then I can, you know, and you, it sort of expands into the building yeah. and that sort of very architectural use of the unit, I think mm -hmm. is very exciting. Uh, Carlo Scarpa, uh, Olivetti, and particularly his use of tile in the Brioni Cemetery, which is mm. just these incredible little moments in concrete that yeah. are just yeah. really heavenly. Little interruptions, yeah. aren't they? Yeah. And then I think Beautiful. contemporary, the, the, the Hermes installation in Milan in 2017, mm. 18, was one that of the most incredible. extraordinary things I've ever seen, yeah. as only Hermes could do. Yeah. At a scale that, you yeah. know, these tiled buildings in a room that you couldn't see the edges of because yeah. it was so big. It was yeah. just extraordinary. And, yeah, you know, the playful thing between the sort of soft and the hard was very, really inspiring, yeah. something we've looked at a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's an incredible reference. And it's interesting when you talk about the astonishing whiteness of the, of the tile. Actually, we always actually forget the incredible functionality and hardwearing nature yeah. of a tile. I mean, it's, you know, they're even, they're put in back, kitchen back fashion mm. and bathrooms and, you know, the, the wipeability of it is just, you know, we kind of take that for granted, but in an incredibly domestic environment, if you're an yeah. urban housewife or a housewife, that was quite a, that was quite a incredible quality to have. Um, and actually, Matthew, I know you're, a lot of your kind of historical re research, and I know it's very, very broad, but it's, it's a lot wrapped up with kind of train stations and those kind of transitory um, moments within our day, which yeah. has informed the cup. I know it's informed the welcome cupboard as well. Yeah, yeah, train stations are um, a good ones. And, you know, they, the, the ones, I guess, that are influencing us now in a tile respect are due to the fact that, uh, again, back to functionality, they, they were wipeable, cleanable after the steam trains came through. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that that kind of exterior, um, yeah, that kind of, you know, it, it can, it can go dark and grubby and, and whatever, and then, and then very quickly have a, have a life of, uh, of its own back again. Um, I've got a quote actually, I, I, can I read it out? Yes, um, please. I've got full geek mode here. This is from, <laughs> um, Alan Graves, who, a senior curator at the v &A, who wrote a lovely piece for a catalogue of mine. I, I, I has reference to this. Um, it says that tiles are mostly uh, associated with urban landscapes, part of the fabric of the city. Tiles are deployed in places where people congregate, in pubs, railway stations, shops, schools, hospitals, the shared spaces of public buildings. Also corridors, tunnels, subways, wherever there is a flow of people or goods. Tiling is thus connected with movement and action. It provides the backdrop to much of the city's social and commercial activity. And I think that that's for me as a quote and, and kind of a little bit intro into how tiles kind of go beyond just the aesthetic for me. It is that relationship with people and, and relationship to the space in which we all kind of interact with. Now, back in Victorian times where you have these luscious tiles, whether they're on pubs or, or train stations, it's different because hopefully we don't need to wipe them clean in, in, a, in the same way because the smog is less of an issue. Um, but that relationship that we have with the tile 
whether it's out on the street or in a kind of domestic setting in, in your shower or whatever, it's that, uh, I guess as an artist, it's something that's real rich territory for me where I can explore that relationship and that, um, that kind of familiarity that people have with these strange square ceramic <laughs> neutral things. Um, and, and, and it's, that's why for me, it kind of, I feel like I'm just getting started with, with the tile. Um, and a lot of that is based on historical references, but it's kind of pushing forwards and, and seeing what we can kind of play with in, in our day. Yeah. And I think it, it would be interesting to touch on your process with, um, with Broil, um, who you worked with to create the, the rustication uh, collection, because going back to Sonia's point, that dialogue between um, manufacturer and craft maker and how those two sort of intertwine, because, I mean, ultimately, the process is incredibly hands-on uh, yeah. working, working with Richard. Um, it'd be, it might be really interesting for the audience just to hear about that as sure. well. well. Well, yeah, Rich, uh, Richard Miller, uh, he's, who's a, uh, an artist in his own right, he also is the owner of Froyles Tiles, which is um, down in Surrey. And I've known Rich in a different realm, but when we kind of came together to develop this range, um, it, it wasn't going to be possible for me to hand roll each tile in the studio for various reasons, mainly cost. But um, Rich has got this amazing uh, factory. He actually described it as a contemporary cottage industry, which was I thought was amazing. It really kind of got me got me going, got me thinking. Um, and he's all set up for making ranges of tiles, various sizes, uh, quantities, what have you. And um, yeah, just this process happened whereby we were going to use some of his processes and machinery to produce the, the, the tiles whilst keeping absolutely the kind of each tile being slightly different and having its own personality and moving and the glaze being able to run and kind of settle in the, in the grooves and the, and the areas. Um, and to celebrate that, it has to be done by hand. So once the tiles are hand pressed based on my designs and my kind of the, 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 the positive tile that I created there, they, they're formed into molds and then each one is hand packed. So there's a relationship with the clay and the hand immediately, then they're dried. And when we talk about handmade tiles without going into too much detail, it's all the stuff that's in between that's kind of lost in the conversation. So yes, it's hand pressed and yes, it's hand glazed, but they're also moved onto boards and those boards are moved and they're moved into different areas. Some are warmer than others to help drying, some are cooler than others to make sure they're nice and flat. Then they're hand loaded into the kiln twice so all, you know, it's not just the glazing and the packing, it's, it's that whole process. And then someone's got to put them in a box. So there's that kind of care and there's that relationship with, you know, one tile, I don't want to work it out, but it's handled many, many times by lots of skilled hands. And I, and I like that journey and that, and that thought. Um, and that kind of um, reaction, I guess, against industry, because obviously it's cheaper to go pop down to tops who have got a lovely range as well. But it's, it's um, yeah, it's that kind of relationship that I was really keen to develop something with Frost. And I've been trying to work with them for ages. So this is the project that, that finally project. came good. So uh, yeah, really, really happy. Um, well, as are we. I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. And I think going back to your point that you said earlier, Matt, about you want the, the sense of the handmade to be visible and obvious, um, through through your work and I don't know if anyone's kind of looked at it really closely but the one called tool you can see kind of um, an implement tool being kind of dragged through the clay and then piano is called piano because it's literally um, Matt's hand kind of tickling the clay. Don't, as it I were. don't play the piano. No <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway um, but um, Tom what what really drew you to these tiles? Because I remember when we started this process of like, and we, we approached Tom and Sasha and was like, would you want to do ways of seeing? And um, we showed them some of the new things in our new collection and instantly it was like, we love those tiles. Well, I think we, we really reacted to the cabinet. Yes. Um, very, very initially. I mean, I like colorful, shiny objects. Um, so that was a no brainer to start with. <laughs> but also it's pretty, um, it's, it's technically quite an impressive thing. 
um, that's that's a hard thing to do, and that's very obvious in, to me, who has to sort of make these things that normally fail uh, <laughs> quite a lot. Um, so it's a it's a it, that was uh, the prowess of it is mm -hmm. is quite interesting. Um, I love glaze, and I like uh, I just find it absolutely fascinating that what comes out one time by just a change of a couple of degrees of or a couple of you know the felt spar isn't quite enough in the in the, you know will create such a different sort of reaction. Mm -hmm. I think tiling and glazing is such a sort of it's uh, it's a sort of alchemy that's still very appealing um, in 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 it, you know even in mass made things it's it's still I suppose it's yeah shiny objects again but um, <laughs> no and I think I think the other thing which we touched on when we were talking about Andre Putman is that idea of modularity is always mm -hmm. very very appealing to an architect because you've just got you know you can you can set things to it and you can make things work work really really well I think. I'm always quite interested in making domestic spaces that are on that, that maybe are using materials in a way that are, are less expected. Mm -hmm. So the idea of a tiled dining room might at first feel cold and but you can imagine at night would glitter and feel incredibly reflective and beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think that that's you know we were we were trying to create a kind of idea of a sort of slightly you know tiled Louis Barragan potentially sort of situation where, where, where a, hall, a hallway would be cold and cool and maybe it's hot outside and it's that kind of idea of, of kind of dark and lustrous yeah. um, so I think that that it sort of immediately resonated with us so that we could do something that we don't necessarily get to do very often yeah because we've tiled enough bathrooms in our lives <laughs> very good bathrooms very Thanks. beautiful um and i love the combination of the other pieces that you've put in i mean there's a lot of the sense of the texture and the leather from and the, the the geometry that actually flows through it yeah. is quite strong well i'm quite simplistic i like things that are made of one or at least appear to be made of one thing um and all of the things that we picked are the coffee table the leather chair yeah you know it's quite yeah. simple so. yeah but um, it's always, um, I'm always amazed kind of watching an interior designer architect work and how they pair materials together and bring a space together. It's, it's quite a unique art and it's a lot tougher than people think. Well, it, it's also a very varied thing. I yes. mean, it's like, it's, I, d I don't really know what an interior designer is. It's a very difficult, it's, it's a huge breadth of very yes. different very different skills and tasks and yes and it's um it's a it's a strange it's a strange marriage of different yeah you know, maybe it's a strange things. it's a strange term because it doesn't yes. really mean anything <laughs> yeah and that actually that is one of my next questions tom um in terms of how you think the role of the interior designer has actually changed over the years um well, has... i think it's so it's it's become horribly um sensitive because you're dealing you know it's very expensive thing to do mm. and you're dealing with people's homes and their futures and their you know at, at the, whatever level you, you're dealing with so and it's it's quite um it's how people want to be or want to project themselves and, and it's got so much of the sort of psychology of space and people in it that's um that can be a brilliant partnership and it can make you know i've got i've been very lucky and I've made some wonderful things mm -hmm. and I've you know been able to work in a very sort of fine and 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 sometimes it's been you know it's it's been very difficult mm -hmm. because of various things to do with mostly to do with sort of a, a, a difference in personalities or mm -hmm. things like that but I think it, when it's good it can be a really it can be a, a very sort of civilizing and forward-thinking thing mm -hmm. and I think it's very important in that yes. respect. Yes, and it, it goes back to your earlier point about you know the opportunity to do commissions. If you have a particular mm. client who will, mm. you know, where there is you know a lot of trust, and they you take those ambitions and risks mm. together, then but it becomes very exciting. It's also to do with because we have to we have, you know, when you commission some something, mm. you you have to trust that that person is able to deliver, Absolutely. and also that they're design sensibility is, is akin enough to yours to be able to go, so this person who I'm working for, this is the person who's going to make it for you and let's hope that marriage yes. is going to happen. So it's always quite a sort of tense yes. 
thing. Yeah. But um, it can be, you know, it can lead to some of the most beautiful things in the world. Yes, and some really incredible innovations yeah. Um, yeah, as well. Yeah. Um, so, are interior designers the modern day patrons in many respects, or the end client is the modern day patron? I'm just trying, if we think about know, it's, it's um, it's historical funny you say, Probably, but it doesn't sit very easily with okay. me. I, I, don't know, I don't know why that is. <laughs> Maybe it's the responsibility. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know why that is. I suppose I think about, pay, I, you know, it's that conversation between art and craft mm. and, you know, what that is. And mm. I think being, I don't know. I don't know is the answer, probably. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> don't need to have all the answers on this panel. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Sonia, um, Coming back to you, obviously craft patronage was a very key way in mm. terms of developing craft over over the years. Um, and I just wondered if you had kind of any specific examples of patrons through the era who have mm. sponsored craft makers to do incredible works that kind of stick in our memories. Yeah, and yeah. So I'm going to go for a really, really high end example and then explain why I've done that and so I mean I think one of the most incredible interiors ever my favourite is Cardiff Castle which was the Earl of Butte commissioned William Burgess in the 19th century to create this extraordinary Victorian Gothic interior from top to bottom Um, it involved stained glass it involved wood carving stone carving tile making furniture ceramics the full works and it was a blend of, of industrial and, uh, and the handmade. But even the industrial, so, so say you take encaustic tiles, which were kind of revived partly you know, through this huge scheme and some of the technological developments that they did to, to um, industrialise encaustic, and that, by, by which I mean the inlaid tiles that you kind of get in, in medieval churches, um, you know, just that created desire for the handmade. So, so sometimes, you know, the reason why I've chosen that high example is that, you, you know, you, you start with, with this, you know, obviously the Earl of Butte was, was hugely wealthy and that was a kind of, um, you know, no, 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 no expense spared refurbishment. But then, you know, it, it created both industrial developments and then in turn desire, which reflected back on the handmade. So people were talking about how you handmade encaustic tiles as well as thinking about how you industrially produce them. So it's kind of like... So he was a bit of a trendsetter. One. Um, he was a trendsetter, yeah, taste, taste maker, um, call, it what, call it what you will. But that it's an extraordinary confection of like craft as you know, the, yeah. and skill in, in that sort of one. And employing vast kind of craft communities, I'm guessing. Yeah, the from the individual the maker yeah. right through to companies yes. and, um, and, and even factories. But it was, that, it was that full spectrum and it was really about pushing the, the, the boundaries of, of skill um, mm. in mostly UK companies yeah. at that time. And actually taking on a huge project to almost yeah. see through that agenda. That it's, it's the completeness of it as well. I mean, you know, uh, but that, that's true of many of the arts and crafts patrons as well. I know we've, we've touched quite a lot on William Morris you kind of can't can't escape him can you but a lot of the arts and crafts patrons who were really sort of signed up to that socialist ideal that 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 purity of the handmade you know they they obviously they they also did the whole scheme from top to bottom from architecture from building the home um you know right through to the choice of metalwork. yeah it's that kind of exacting um, of detail and yeah yeah but I th- but I think I think the retail is retailer is huge in this as well mm. so um you know, you, you get key retailers through time, like Liberty and Co, for example, who are kind of absolutely key in um, championing the crafts person mm-hmm. and um, you know making that accessible to a wider audience. So yeah. I think it's not always that sort of top-down single person. Yeah, it's coming um, from all different yeah, angles, yeah, yeah, as yeah. it were. Yeah, and yeah. um, Matthew, for you, how what role has patronage played in? supporting your projects and your ambitions and dream projects, actually? Yeah, um, well, I've got a kind of uh, a, a story that kind of relates to, in a more traditional sense, but I, I guess the first patrons were my mum and dad because, you know, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to learn something somewhere. And um, if we start talking about the future of, of craft and skill and all of, all of that, then, you know, how does one go to find those skills these days? Um, I'm doing some research. At, um, I've got a commission with Loughborough University at the moment, and I've got this amazing rich history about arts and design colleges and people gaining skills, whether they be after work or um, 
you know, after the war, all this super interesting layered history where it was really open for everybody to kind of be, well, it was more accessible. You, you know, now you, you need patrons in your family to get you to university. And um, that doesn't really bode well, in my opinion, for uh, the future, if you need to saddle yourself with that amount of uh, of debt, because it's a, you know, it's a tricky world out there. And it's taken me a long time to establish myself. And I have supportive parents and who could support me. Uh, and without going off on a massive rant, you know, that, there's, that is something to think about. Um, but then a few years down the line after studying, uh, I was accepted onto the residency at the V&A, uh, which Elena mentioned at the beginning. And there were some um, kind of blind donors, I guess, in the background who wanted to sponsor a residency, but, but weren't um, getting involved in the process of selection. So after I was selected, I was introduced to this lovely couple, Margaret and Jeremy uh, Strachan, and uh, met them and got on with them very well. Uh, and things kind of led on and we built our relationship and I, I've been to visit them in their house in France and uh, they're a really lovely couple and they helped me get my first Arts Council bid by kind of providing an initial uh, tranche of money which the Arts Council could then kind of um, match and, and that I guess is, is kind of they helped me with the V&A which has been huge and that's where the initial research into rustication came from. So in this context, it was it was big, but then they kind of have, have gone on to support me, and I feel like in the future, you know, they could support me again. But I um, I, I think that that's a kind of my insight into into patients, and the, the first time that that happened to me, maybe the last time, I don't know. <laughs> Hopefully not the last time, Matthew. But it does it does kind of underline the importance of patronage of support that you know makers um it's not just um materials it's it's space it's it's rent it's there's a lot of different factors that need to be supported uh, which is hopefully one of the things that we try to address um through the new craftsman um by having that platform by connecting with clients such as uh, waldo Wertz and tom and, and private clients um, so that there are those sort of opportunities and certain ambitions can be realised and certain experiments can take place, whether it be a piano tile or, or something else. Um, hopefully, there are, there are hopefully emerging channels and means um, coming to the fore. Um, and that really concludes our, our panel discussion. Um, so thank you so much for uh, being here and listening. And thank you, Matt, for joining us um, over Zoom. I hope it wasn't too odd for everyone, um, the, the digital presence, but I think it worked actually very well. Um, I wanted to ask if there's any questions from the audience. Well, with the idea that the, 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 the green cabinet come from, was it commissioned or was it entirely Matthew's? Matthew, did you hear that? I got half of it. Um, so Sarah asked, um, what, where did the idea from the, for the welcome cupboard come from? Um, was it entirely your idea or was it sparked by um, a commission? Um, it was sparked by the new craftsman approaching me to make um, A, the range, and B, a piece of furniture. Uh, so talking to, to Cathy and Catherine and Yelena about making a piece of furniture to go alongside the the, the, the tile so absolutely um this commission if you will was, was the catalyst for for the, the the product um some of their mood boards really helped some of the conversations about um yeah about about kind of bringing uh, functionality to to tiles and bringing them into a, a piece of furniture a uh, table a kind of a table was banded at the beginning and then things kind of developed on and i thought it might be interesting to clad a cupboard and then found out that's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> but you did it. Um, Can I ask how many prototypes? The first one collapsed <laughs> under its weight. Um, no, I don't know. Matthew, you tell us. <laughs> don't lift it up. Um, it's, uh, I, w I worked with this uh, an old friend of mine in Manchester, which is where I'm from, who's a furniture maker. and. I, I, I'm always an optimist when it comes to this kind of stuff. So I thought, I'll quick chat with Greg. 
we'll come up, I'll tell him what I want, we'll come up with some quick dimensions and then I'll, I'll start rolling. And um, bless Greg, you know, the back and forth between the two about how, how the towels would wrap and we're trying to keep this kind of modular thing. Um, and then I, and then he kind of got the, the outside and I was like, oh, and by the way, it needs to be on the inside as well. And he, um, he's very patient. So it, it was a collaboration to kind of get it to the stage of, is this thing going to be the right dimensions? Because um, my woodworking skills won't, won't uh, you know, I need help in that area. I'm very happy to admit. Um, so yeah, so it was, um, the catalyst was a new craftsman. There were, there were lots of, it was all digital actually, um, just kind of working out how it wrapped and then it's over to the clay and the clay will do what the clay does. Um, and it's, a, it's an amazing cabinet. I have to think of all the comments that we've had since we've opened, it's been largely around that cabinet. And I think it's the surprise and treat that you get when you open and look inside. And um, it's interesting when we, I think when we approached Matthew, I mean, Catherine was our creative director, who's here as well this evening, was just basically, there's just not a tile cabinet. We need a tile cabinet. And, <laughs> um, and so Welcome Cupboard was born. Thank you. Um, any other questions? I have a sort of um, tangential thought yes. <laughs> that I wanted to put out. Um, sustainability is something that has been in my mind a lot recently, and I think it has been for a lot of us. Um, and the idea of craft is something that's very close to my heart. I'm a, trained as an architect and an interior designer, and making, I think, is something beautiful. And the idea of making and fixing is another thing that when you make a special object by hand, inherently you can fix it, mm -hmm. ideally, mm -hmm. and it lives a life. Mm -hmm. And funnily enough, tonight I bumped into Bill Amberg, and Bill did a leather floor for us and um, 10 years ago, and now we're about to, to refurbish the floor, and it's probably the wrong word, but so that it can live another 10 years. And this, moment that we're in now where um, we are trying to create a better world um, and I wonder your thoughts about craft and sustainability and the fact that there, that potentially there's hope for um, a, a resurgence and, a, and an interest in craft because actually there is inherently within it um, sustainability that comes out because it lives this, you this, know, longer life. this long life. I think we're already seeing that from our clients. If I, if I think about when I, I started out um, in this company about six, seven years ago, um, and working with um, interior designers and other private clients, very rarely was I asked about the traceability of, of a material or a process. And actually more and more now, they, would, they want that as facts. And actually one of our interior designers is, um, is registering as a as a sustainable practice so we've got a lot of paperwork now to fill out and I think that's going to become more and more of the norm and there's the beautiful sort of um I mean obviously there are some practices within craft we should own up to that that are aren't sustainable at all you know I mean glass blowing and things like you know there are there are and certain ceramic. things and and ceramics as well <laughs> um but, but there is a is, there's a longevity yeah. exactly and there's there there's a permanence there's a you're investing in something for the long term, not to rip it out, which actually happens a lot with um, uh, development properties and things. So, you know, joinery gets ripped out after just like two years. It's um, and it can it can seem very wasteful. But I think hopefully, if you're connecting with a human being, a narrative, and you're inserting that in your home, then you're you're almost committing to something uh, through that commission. Uh, it's not just an order, it's your commissioning well, I something. I think the thing about fixing things mm. is really is really important. Mm. I think the reality of what glue has done is a it, to, it's to us yeah. is, has, is <laughs> quite frightening mm. because you used to be able to disassemble a piece of joinery, you used to be able to take the tile off or maybe a little bit more. Yeah. But, but we're so good at fixing things to things mm. that actually mm. it's, it's become really quite a problem yeah because you can't recycle anything yeah because it's pasted in 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 a very efficient glue yes and frankly if you can make joinery or make things in a way that is faintly traditional mm -hmm. and isn't relying on those things and you know how to do it mm -hmm. 
and you have the person who can do it. Mm. These things are inherently sustainable. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, mm. Matthew, did you have any yeah, thoughts I, on that? Well, um, I, actually, this thought came up a while back, but uh, Johnson's Tiles, one of the big manufacturers in Britain, are coming up with a, a Velcro system so that you can change your tiles in your bathroom or your kitchen or whatever without having to use adhesive. So you can, once you chip away the grout, I guess, you can you can just peel them off and, and pop a new lot up if, if, you, <laughs> if you wish. There are people thinking about, about that. Um, architecturally, uh, which is a, a kind of word I've been dabbling with for a couple of years now, uh, exterior tiles are having a massive renaissance because they can be clipped into position. So there's no adhesive, they're not being glued to a breeze block wall, for example. They're, they're, it's all a very intricate, clever hanging system that I don't understand. But they, they're, they're clipped and they're kind of um, yeah, screwed into position so that they can have a they can have rain going down the back, all, the, all these kind of architectural uh, feats. But um, they are being, you have to pay for the privilege of having your building clad in, in ceramics. But once you do, so that the architects say it's not like a wood that you have to replace after 10 years or you have to strip back and re-varnish it, it has a you know look at the back to the pubs and the train stations you know they do last so having said that they do take a lot of energy to to create which i which i appreciate and there, there is in industry again in in architectural tiles um, they're always coming up with composites or ways of firing things at a lower temperature, at a faster rate, maybe just one firing instead of two or three. So that, I mean, I guess that's economics, but as a result, the sustainability and the energy you use is less. Mm. Uh, it's interesting kind of using craft as an ingredient in, in, as an, in an architectural sense. It's usually just used in a more decorative, but in an architectural sense, then it can actually have it may answer some questions around sustainability, which we haven't thought of because it's not often considered in an architectural way. And I think that's very exciting. Um, yes. Anyone else? We'll wrap up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.